Welcome to E-Town Links, a virtual resource for area businesses working to adapt to the effects of COVID-19. My name is Matthew Fritz and I'm Associate Professor of Music at Elizabethtown College and I'm one of your co-moderators for today. Kelly Fuddy is my esteemed partner in crime. Kelly? Hello, that's me. Hi everybody. I hope you're having a great afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to for us to share with you today a conversation uh, with our local municipal leaders. Um, and coming up, we have some great programs for you to continue to share um, with others who might be interested in learning what's going on and how we're adapting to COVID-19 continually in our community. I said to someone last night that it feels like every 48 hours is like another six months in terms of how much things change um, compared to how they used to. So we're happy to continue providing this up-to-date information for you. I'm currently uh, filling in as interim support staff here at the chamber. I was here previously as the membership manager. I'm happy to be connected to so many great local business owners uh, and business people. Once again, uh, we have hired a new executive director and we're excited to introduce her to you. Um, that'll be forthcoming details. Um, but for now, let's get to our session for today. Um, that back over to you. Great, thanks Kelly. Uh, today's topic will be recorded and placed online at the E-Town Chamber's website. Please consider posting a question in the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. The moder moderators will share those questions with the panelists. Our topic today is a conversation with our borough and municipalities, specifically the managers. Uh, myriad issues face local municipalities. Among them are zoning development, the spotted lanternfly, and of course, COVID-19. Managers keep their fingers on the pulse of, the, of our community, and our panelists today will share information regarding active projects and policies related to our municipalities, both in response to and in spite of the pandemic. John Yoder is a registered architect and came to full-time employment in municipal administration after 33 years of experience in building design and construction in central Pennsylvania. John got a start in local government by serving in an appointed position on West Donegal Township's Planning Commission for four years, from January 2004 through December 2011. During 2011, he ran for and won a seat on the Board of Supervisors for the Township, where he served for six years. At that point, he resigned from that position to accept the position of Township Manager for West Donegal. While a township supervisor, he served in the vice chairman and treasurer positions and oversaw the township's information technology operations. John also presented the township on, represented the township on the Northwest Regional Police Commission for all six years of his service as a supervisor. He is also a member of the board of, of the Elizabethtown Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, John. Justin Evans earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Geography from Ohio University with a co-op experience in land surveying. He also attended the University of Tennessee to obtain a Master of Science in Planning and Certification through the American Institute of Certified Planners. Justin became the Mount Joy Township Manager in September 2016, having previously worked at the Township's Community Development Director. He has worked in the public sector in the fields of planning, zoning, and community development since 2003. Welcome, Justin. And Rebecca Sechrist Denglinger, Denglinger, sorry, Denlinger, I'll spit it out, is the borough manager for Elizabethtown Borough. Throughout her 30 plus years working for and directly in local government, she has been a champion for helping people and communities accomplish great things that improve quality of life. Ms. Denglinger's career has included leadership roles in both the public and private sectors. She's been instrumental in helping communities and organizations build capacity, as well as create and execute action-oriented strategic plans. With an emphasis on sustainable imp implementation, Ms. Denglinger has helped secure over 150 million in community and economic development program and project funding, impacting over 50 communities. Ms. Denglinger earned her undergraduate degree in economics and political science from the University of Delaware and a Master's of Public Administration from the Pennsylvania State University. She's also a Certified Economic Development Professional through the National Development Council. Welcome, Rebecca. And panelists, take it away. Okay, good afternoon. I think I'm up first. And here we go. Uh, my name is Rebecca Denlinger. I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, E-Town Links online meeting. Uh, I want to thank the Chamber for hosting this. Um, so I've only been in this position here in Elizabethtown for a little, uh, 
under six months. And so um, nothing like starting a new job and then having a pandemic hit. Uh, so we'll start with a little bit of history. Historians recognize that Elizabeth and Barnabas Hughes as the founding family of Elizabethtown. So back in 1730, there was a trading post that was called um, the Bear Tavern. Uh, and uh, it was laid out on the Kanoi Creek. And Barnabas purchased the Bear Tavern in 1753 and laid out a town and named it at Elizabethtown after his wife. Um, so Elizabethtown here, we celebrated our 175th anniversary in 2002. And believe it or not, we're actually starting to get ready to plan our 200th anniversary, which will happen in 2027. Let's see if my clicker works. There we go. So uh, we're here today to talk about local government. And I think it was Thomas Jefferson who said, the government closest to the people serves the people best. So as I give you a little bit of the facts and figures about Elizabethtown, uh, I thought I'd share a few pictures of the wonderful people who make up the borough of, of Elizabethtown family. Um, these are the folks that I work with and work for. Um, we really have a great team here in Elizabethtown. So in terms of the numbers, Elizabethtown has a population of at least 11,545. And I say at least because according to the County Planning Commission, we likely passed 12,000 in 2015, uh, and we are projected to have a little over 12,500 residents this year in 2020. And I guess at this point, I'll put in a plug for everyone to please respond to your 2020 U.S. Census that's going on right now. Super important to all of the municipalities in terms of um, counting every family, counting every resident. It has a direct impact on the funding uh, programs and resources that communities receive. So Elizabethtown is approximately 2.6 square miles. We have about 40 miles of public roads and highways. Uh, we have a staff of approximately 40 full-time employees that serve the community. Uh, we do take on part-time and seasonal employees as necessary. Uh, we currently operate out of five different buildings. Um, most of the borough business takes place right here where I am at 600 South Hanover Street. That's where the borough uh, council chambers are as well. Um, we do own and operate a wastewater treatment facility that's located in uh, West Donegal Township. Um, and we recently dedicated a new public works facility on South Market Street. So boroughs are set up a little bit differently under the um, Commonwealth. Uh, we have a different set of laws that we operate under. Um, we operate under a council manager form of government, which means that we have borough councilors um, that make decisions on policy and a borough manager who's responsible for running the borough according to that established policy. Um, we have six elected borough council members. They're elected by wards uh, for four-year terms. Um, and the borough has three wards with two council members representing each ward. Um, we also, and again, this is unique to boroughs and cities, we have an elected mayor who oversees the police department and that's stipulated by Pennsylvania law. The mayor does have the ability to break um, ties to cast a tie-breaking vote uh, if Borough Council reaches a tie on the adoption of any legislation. So here in E-Town, Borough Council meets twice a month, the first and third Thursdays at 7 o'clock p.m. Public is welcome to attend. Um, we always enjoy having people at our meetings. Um, we also do have a number of ABCs, authorities, boards, and commissions that are um, largely made up of residents and volunteers. Uh, and so encourage people to find out about our authorities, boards, and commissions. And if you're ever interested in serving, please throw your name in that we, we want you to participate and get, and get active. Um, so as a borough manager, I work closely with the police chief. I also oversee our day-to-day -day operations. Um, we're managed through a, different, uh, a number of different departments, administration and finance planning, zoning, and code enforcement, um, and public works, which is further broken down into our wastewater treatment plant, highway, and parks. Uh, we do our best to communicate with residents and businesses through our website, as well as a growing presence on social media. Um, and really, that's one area where we are always trying to do a little bit better. Um, so speaking of communication, like I said, um, and using social media to get messaging out, there's nothing like a pandemic to force an organization to really up its game. Um, we, when the coronavirus hit um, and we uh, declared a public emergency, we set up a special page on our borough website, um, really not to act as, a, a, as an authority on the issue, but really just more as a clearinghouse of information. So with links to the CDC, State Department of Health and, and, and other organizations that are providing um, ongoing information about the pandemic. Um, we also used it just to post our own announcements, again, declaration of emergencies, anything that might impact uh, how our parks were open or not open. Uh, we started to do, a police department did drive-by celebrations, and so we really used the website 
um, and our social media, which really at this point is, is Facebook primarily um, to get messaging out. Uh, in terms of how we operated throughout the pandemic and, and, pandemic and continue to operate, um, we are still holding public meetings um, in person. Uh, we do allow for a Zoom, um, folks to Zoom in. I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be doing that. I, I think that we'll be getting back to regular meetings very, very soon. Um, we did have to put a number of projects on hold, so infrastructure that could wait another year, we did put on hold, again, because of the inability to run full staff for a few weeks, we decided to put some things on hold. Um, and one of the things, and this, like many businesses, we really don't have a sense right now of the financial impact that, that, that COVID-19 is going to have on our budget. Um, so far, we've seen our revenues, which is largely real estate taxes and earned income tax, um, come in okay, um, but we do anticipate that heading into the third quarter and fourth quarter of this fiscal year, we are going to see that impact our budget um, to a good degree. And so we are going to pay close attention to that uh, and make sure that we're planning uh, accordingly. Um, so speaking of planning, one of the things that we do um, really well in this region is, um, is plan. And we do have a good history of cooperation in the region. Um, and what's, you know, it's, it's typical uh, across Lancaster County. Many people who say they live in Elizabethtown may not actually live in the borough. They're actually residents of the region. Um, and so this region actually under, a, under uh, operates under a comprehensive, a regional comprehensive plan. Um, our last comp plan was done in 2010. And so um, one of the things that our partners will be doing um, now that the county has passed their places 2040 plan uh, is to start to uh, look at the update or or even the creation of a new regional comp plan for the elizabethtown region um, and that's exciting because the the comp plan really does govern um, how we plan for the future how we plan for future growth and development um, and so it's not only a critical process but it's also um, a, a very critical document in terms of helping us um, guide what we're doing in terms of zoning, planning, and other governance policies and programs. So I'm not going to get into the weeds too far on this. Maybe this is something that Justin and John can talk more about, but we do, um, we do fall under what's called an MS4. We are a municipal separate stormwater um, community, and so the stormwater requirements of the Federal Clean Water Act, they're administered under the state's um, MS4 program. And so under this program, we're required to implement a stormwater management program um, to minimize the impacts of runoff. Um, and so we, like many, many communities, are just right now working to, drove, to both understand how we're affected by it uh, and to prepare our plans so that we can um, participate and be within the compliance that the state requires uh, for MS4 communities. Also in terms of planning, um, one of the things that, I think I went one too far. Uh-oh, that's okay though. Um, one of the things that we do for planning is complete streets and, and pedestrian pathway planning. And so this really gets to the heart of um, what we'll talk about is in terms of placemaking. So Elizabethtown is a super important, super special community. Um, placemaking is, is, is kind of this comprehensive approach to how communities plan and design to manage their public spaces. Uh, and so essentially placemaking allows a community like Elizabethtown to capitalize on our assets. Um, as a planning tool, it's a great framework. It allows us to get creative um, and hopefully realize our potential. So the goal is to create public spaces that promote um, health and happiness and well-being. Um, and so in terms of what Elizabethtown has been doing over the last 10, 10 15 years is um, planning for downtown redevelopment and revitalization, planning for uh, pathways, um, and also the borough has long prioritized the de development of parks and recreation. So we have a 39 acre linear park um, complete with trails, pavilions, basketball courts, softball field, play equipment, you name it. Um, and we also have a growing pedestrian and bicycle pathway network that connects the Amtrak station to the downtown area, residential neighborhoods, schools, Elizabethtown College. So, um, so doing a lot of planning in, on, on, that, on that front in terms of placemaking and connecting all the different areas of the borough. Um, we also have adopted a complete streets policy. So the policy allows us every year as we put our budget together to make sure that when we're planning for street improvement projects, we plan for everyone that's gonna be using those streets. So whether it's a car, a bicycle, uh, a pedestrian, um, ADA compliance, public transportation, we're making sure that all of our plans are done um, with all of those folks in mind. 
And then the other thing that I wanted to just hit on really quickly was, and again, it's a plan that's unfortunately had to be put on hold. Um, we are starting to plan for our future municipal facilities. Like I said, we're now operating under out of five different facilities and we are looking at potentially moving our borough operations into the downtown. Again, it would allow us to be part of that downtown revitalization effort that's going on. Um, we do own a property at 56 North Market Street. And so this is just a rendering of what, um, if we were to move forward with a future municipal building, the um, Borough Hall at 56 North Market, this is what it might look like. So a lot of projects, a lot of exciting things happening um, in Elizabethtown and the region. And I uh, look forward to uh, answering any questions and being part of the conversation. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, wonderful to hear all the great things that are going on in, in the borough. Uh, I think we'll toss now over to Justin. There we are, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Justin Evans, manager with Mountjoy Township. And um, if you don't already know, Mountjoy Township with alongside uh, West Donegal Township forms a little bit of a, a cushion around Elizabethtown Borough. And, you know, a lot of our residents consider themselves part of the Elizabethtown community. Um, but some of you may not know that we actually are part of two different school districts. About two thirds of the township from Cloverleaf Road West is in the Elizabethtown Area School District. And east of that is in the Donegal School District. And most of those addresses and, and relationships are with the Mount Joy Borough community. But a lot of our growing area is around Elizabethtown Borough and associates themselves with the community. Uh, making this a, a very uh, appropriate conversation for today. We just moved into, uh, wow, it's, it's been almost three years now, moved into the Fairview, former Fairview Elementary School at 8853 Elizabethtown Road. So out High Street and into Elizabethtown Road is where we're located now. Um, the Regional Police Department that serves our community as well as West Donegal Township's community is also headquartered here um, next door to us in the municipal building that you see. Um, myself and five other joined by um, six public works um, staff members that maintain our roadway storm sewer system and our municipal parks. Um, kind of an interesting time, obviously, right now uh, with the, uh, the whole COVID situation. The, the important part that we've all been, you know, all of our communities, all of our uh, you know, public employees have been trying to do over the last few months is to, to keep operating, to keep uh, providing these important services to our, to our businesses, to our residents um, throughout all this. Um, and the biggest thing um, as in my role as a manager has been kind of balancing people's access to public services with the, with the health and safety of our employees. So we recently reopened uh, back to the public uh, within the last month. Um, but have been, you know, trying to balance these things and, you know, the plexiglass shields with the receptionist and, you know, asking people to wear a mask unless they have a health issue to, when they come into the building to either pay bills or pick up leaf bags. Things like that has been, um, I think, well received by our public. We're very appreciative of that for, for the health and safety of our, of our folks. Um, and I think it just shows that the Elizabethtown community you know, they, they kind of get the bigger picture uh, as much as we want to be able to just be free to do what we want. Um, they've been respectful of that. So that's fa been fantastic. Another thing is July, we've brought the public meetings back from the virtual world. Um, July 1st was our zoning hearing board meeting that we held um, live um, back from, from Zoom and we held live here in the meeting room. Last night we had our parks and recreation uh, board meeting was in person and then we'll have our board of supervisors back on Monday. So barring no major critical setbacks in Lancaster County, we'll continue that moving forward. Um, another important thing that we've, we uh, have been trying to progress that I'll touch on here in a, in a few more minutes has been keeping public works um, on track. So a pretty aggressive road improvement and repair uh, program that we put together starting back in 2018, we've been able to keep uh, moving on full force uh, with the exception of a few, you know, some lost weeks there in late March and early April as we tried to find our proper footing as to how we should be managing staff through all of this. 
Um, our community is still growing. Uh, as, as many of you know, the E-Town region's population is steadily rising and has been for a couple of decades. Um, the housing demand has, has stayed strong in our area and you know, Mount Joy Township being in the crosshairs with having um, uh, open land within our urban growth area, going back to Rebecca's point of our regional comprehensive planning. You know, we've had a strong history here for decades of regional comprehensive planning uh, within the Elizabethtown Area School District to find where are the appropriate places for business and industrial growth, as John will probably talk about. Um, much, much of our area has been developed in a residential sense, given that um, there is um, access to uh, Route 283 with two interchanges. That seems to be uh, kind of a common theme of our area as being a place where a lot of commuters will go to Hershey, Harris, Harrisburg, Lancaster, uh, but I think you find a lot of people seeing that the Elizabethtown community is a very attractive area, the college, uh, the downtown, and all those sorts of things. Uh, so we've seen, regardless of the kind of the COVID slowdown and our uh, building code officials company had shut down for probably about a week or a month or six weeks during all of that, our permit applications and permit issuance has actually outpaced 2019, uh, about 110%. So some of that was a lot of DIY projects, fences, decks, et cetera. While people were out of work, uh, still we're seeing a lot of new home growth and things like that within our growth area. So uh, that's something that I think you even see the um, Economic Development Company of Lancaster had noted. Uh, that the construction industry had stayed strong through all this, but that may not necessarily be an indicator moving forward. Um, so there's a lot of interesting economic data coming out of them with their new center for, for research. Um, but realistically, you know, we have to look, what's the, what's the game plan for our future growth? How is our community supposed to stay growing? Um, you know, again, with, the, with internal growth from families growing, but also people moving into the area. Um, how, how are we going to fit these folks in here into the E-Town community, but also do the thing that we've been trying to do for decades, which is preserve and maintain our agricultural economy in those rural areas. So that's going to be a main topic, as Rebecca, John, and myself have been talking about for uh, months, and that's rejuvenating a refresh to our comprehensive plan for the next decade. Um, public recreation and open spaces has been a, um, a, a priority for our Board of Supervisors as a policy for, for uh, quite some time now, and we just opened our third township park uh, within the last couple of years down at Old Trolley Line Park on Beverly Road, so north of Elizabethtown um, on the way to Hershey. Um, we're very proud of the three parks, and uh, this newest park is going to get kind of its second wave of improvements in 2021 with two sets of playgrounds, um, a picnic pavilion, and some other amenities to go along with the uh, ballparks that are there now, the walking trails, and also the trailhead access to the Conewago Trail, which is a county park. Um, also, some of the, the biggest focus uh, of the last few years has been implementing our road improvement plan. In 2018, we, we put together a five-year capital plan for 2019 through 2023. Um, and now we've just worked on refreshing for 21 through 25. In the first two years of that plan, we've achieved quite a bit of things, but with 66 miles of road and a lot of those being a lot uh, much older infrastructure that may not have necessarily been built with proper bases or widths and stormwater management. A lot of that is very time consuming and expensive, um, but it's something that we've been trying to systematically approach. We have, uh, as a matter of fact, a draft plan um, going to the Board of Supervisors next Monday um, for 2021 to 2025. Now, this is um, a very preliminary draft to where we're gonna have to sharpen the pencils and figure out how to make the work into the budget, as Rebecca noted. Um, you know, revenues may be fairly solid this year, but there's a couple things on the horizon. And, and when you think about, you know, earned income tax and people being out of work and things like that, it's, it's, it's 
very important to understand we're going to see a drop off there, um, whether it be later this year or next year. But the other thing that um, we have to realize is there's going to be a, a most likely a decrease in liquid fuels funding from the state that goes towards a lot of these road road projects. Um, it may not be felt this year, may not even be felt next year, um, but the, the decrease in gas tax revenues um, will probably hit us sometime in, in 21 or most likely in 22. So that's something um, very important that we all have to factor in um, from municipal government while keeping a lot of these projects and improvements forthcoming because as, as, as something that many people realize, especially coming out of the winter, that you know the deterioration of our roadways um, is something that continues to happen year over year if we're not maintaining them adequately. So this is something that I think we, we're gonna continue to fund at its current rate um, within our means. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to our neighbor, uh, John in West Donegal. All righty. Uh, see if I can click my slides here. There we go. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name's John Yoder. I'm the manager for West Donegal Township. I've been in this role um, a little over two and a half years. It will be three years uh, come the beginning of December. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, although I'm sure many of you do, um, West Donegal is the township that is most uh, directly south and west of the borough. And the map on the screen, if you, see, if you can see the red line on the map, uh, that's the boundary of the township. Um, the area was settled in 1719 uh, and then was organized into a township in, uh, by the Chester County Court in 1722. And at that time, it was one of the two major townships that made up uh, Pens Pen uh, Lancaster County, this part of Pennsylvania. Uh, on, July, on June 24th of uh, 1838, uh, we have the exact date, so we know when our birthday is. Uh, on June 24th, uh, the Donegal Township was split into two, which became East Donegal and West Donegal Township. So we include uh, the village of Reams. And if you go out Turnpike Road, we include the little village of Newville as well uh, within, our, within our boundary. We are approximately 15.6 square miles, 63 miles of roadway. Of, of that 63 miles, 13 are state roadways. So 743, 241, uh, Turnpike, and uh, 230, or Market Street, as you might be familiar with it as are all uh, state roadways. So um, the state maintains those. We, we maintain the, uh, the other 50. We have about 9,000 residents. Uh, I did, was doing a little demographic digging the other day and, and found out that 33% uh, of our residents are 65 and older within the township. And when I looked at the borough and I looked at Mount Joy Township, uh, their percentages were 15 and 16%. And, but that's not hard to imagine because uh, Masonic Village exists almost entirely within West Donegal Township and it has uh, approximately 1800 residents at this time. So that skews our number uh, a little bit, uh, but we do have that particular uh, uh, institution in our township and we're glad to have them there. Uh, it was interesting to find out that we're now at 9,000 residents. Um, for a long time, we were in the, in the low 8,000s, but within the last couple of years, it has really kicked up. And I think that's in, in keeping with some of our housing developments and with the growth that we're seeing in the region in general. And this, gives you, this slide here gives you just a little idea of our population density. The darker the, the red color, uh, is the the more dense the population is, and that's that picks up a lot of our uh, a lot of our rural or, or, or residential zones, and you can see uh, in the center here, right above West Donegal, you can see that's the that's the location of Masonic Village, and then the other red splotches around are our house various housing developments within our urban growth boundary, which Justin alluded to a little bit, and we'll talk about a little bit more. Here's our zoning map. 
the big blue blob in the middle is Masonic Village. So that gives you some graphic representation about how, uh, how much land they cover within our township. It is, it is quite significant. Uh, any of the light green you see is uh, agricultural land and zoned agricultural and in many cases, in almost all cases, is actively farmed. Uh, the uh, yellows and oranges and reds are uh, residential land and uh, we have a mining district because of the quarry uh, down in Reams. We also have an industrial zone up in the north, which is the, you know, the Conewago Industrial Park, as well as that institutional uh, section right in the middle. Uh, speaking of farms, farmland, um, you can see from this map a very significant portion of the township is in ag preserve, meaning it's preserved farmland, it will not be developed. Uh, and, and that's a rather significant uh, portion of our township. It's probably somewhere between a third and a quarter of the land mass in the township is, is in preserve farm. The other thing that's uh, helpful to see in this map uh, you see a gray tone that encompasses uh, almost the entirety of the, bur of the borough and it has arms that kind of reach into West Donegal and it has other arms that reach over into Mount Joy Township. That is um, from the comprehensive plan, the urban growth area. So that was the area um, 10 years ago and, and even farther back than that, that the, the region established as our, through comprehensive planning as our area where we would uh, where we would grow in the future. So um, that's where most of our residential development has occurred. There are some spots that are undeveloped, but are not zoned residential within that urban growth or zoned commercial. So most likely will not get residential development, but uh, we're getting close to soon being uh, built out in West Donegal Township from a, uh, from a residential construction standpoint. The other big item in our township is the Conewago Industrial Park. And uh, as of the beginning of this year, the park is, for all intents and purposes, completely built out. Uh, this photograph here is from 2018, which is the earliest free photograph I can find, or the latest free photograph I can find without paying. Um, and there have been two buildings built. I see if you can see my cur the moving the cursor. There have been two buildings built in this location. Another building built here and a final building built uh, over underneath uh, the, the pictures of all of us um, for uh, Grove Collaborative, which is another major uh, tenant within the industrial park. So right now within the industrial park, I think everybody's aware that Amazon exists in the park and that's this building down here, it says IT, uh, ITW Angle Board, that is now Amazon's local distribution hub. Uh, they're working on their parking lots uh, in this location and in this location for their vans. So hopefully someday in the not too distant future, all the vans will leave the Darren Camps uh, parking lot, which I know has caused some heartache for some people. Uh, within that park, we have, uh, as I said, Amazon. We have Nordstrom, which is the entire uh, East Coast Fulfillment Center. So if you buy anything from Nordstrom, online uh, on the east coast of the United States. It's, it's processing through this fulfillment center. And in Grove Collaborative, which is a, uh, a west coast company, uh, we also have their east coast distribution center within the park, as well as uh, DAS companies, um, Trogues uh, Brewing has a, has a facility within the, within the park and a number of other local businesses. So it's, it's thriving. The, the lure that we put in place in 2013 to attract Nordstrom has done as it was intended and has built out the park. So we're very pleased by that. Um, it's a very good uh, uh, tax base for us and makes it easier to, to not put as much of a tax burden on residential uh, property. And I, I know that's, it's, it's a luxury for us and we're really happy about it and we're glad that it's there. It has its challenges, but uh, it's, it's a good thing uh, for, the, for the township and for the region, I would say. There's a lot of employment that happens within that park. A Couple of uh, challenges facing the township, obviously COVID-19, the response and operation 
Um, very similar to uh, what Justin and Rebecca have said, uh, we have done everything we could to maintain our um, continued operation. Uh, we, we never really stopped operating uh, in, a, in our office area. Uh, we, we have a very, unfortunately, we have a very lar a larger building than we have staff. So we have plenty of room to social distance without stopping operation. So we, we continued to operate. We were closed to the public <clears throat> for a couple of weeks, but um, opened up on, with restricted hours and then with a little less restricted hours. And then the, as the beginning of June, middle of June, we opened completely to the public. Uh, we do require that you wear a mask when you come into the building as, as most places are. Uh, our public works has continued to function uh, to the best of their ability. We uh, were very fortunate in that we, were, we had planned for kind of a, uh, a breather year this year with regards to road work. We're trying to uh, marshal resources for some more uh, intense projects in the out years. So this year was kind of a, a small project year. So um, COVID didn't really bother us or didn't set any plans back for us, thankfully. The, th the couple of projects we will uh, embark on are stormwater related and they can, they can happen a little later. And so we're hoping we can catch up to those uh, later this month, beginning of next month. Um, the tax revenue is the biggest issue that we're tracking and are most concerned about. Um, we have seen a steady uh, flow of revenue from property tax. We think we're going to be fine there. Uh, local services tax, we think we're going to be fine there. Um, employment tax, I think we're going to be fine there. We, we do see potential for uh, losing money in property transfer tax uh, because of the shutdown in the real estate market. Now, what we have noticed is that since uh, the governor allowed real estate to come back online, there was an immediate jump in that uh, within the township. We kind of track when properties sell and, and we've noticed that uh, an uptick in that. I'm, given what we lost, I'm not sure we're gonna make it all back, but. Uh, that's one of those things, as I think both Rebecca and Justin alluded to, we're not going to see, we may not see that until third or fourth quarter this year or sometime next year, see that impact. So from a budgetary standpoint, we might be fine this year, but uh, the next year will be the one that we're looking out for. And budget season is starting soon. We usually begin our budget process um, in the beginning of the third quarter because we want to get it done before the end of the year. Nobody wants to show up on Christmas Eve for a, uh, for a workshop to uh, ratify the budget. So we always try and get it done quicker. Uh, spotted lanternfly uh, infestation. We have not seen too much within our township, although we have started to see little bits and pieces here and there. Um, we don't have a whole lot of forested land. We have a lot of farmland. We have patches of forest. So we're more uh, trying to keep our residents on the lookout for this and, uh, and deal with it. Uh, we've been very fortunate to date, have, have, have not seen many, uh, but I hear, I hear rumors from other townships to the south of us and, and to the east of us that uh, it's coming. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be, we'll be able to stop it. I think the best we can do is kind of fight it off as much as we can, but I don't think it will be able to be stopped. Um, MS4, which Rebecca alluded to, that's a new one for us. Uh, it is unfunded. Uh, it's an unfunded mandate, meaning we're required to do it. But unless you are, uh, unless you have a project immediately ready to go, it's hard to get grant money for it. So we are we're in the first part. We're in the very beginning of a five-year permit cycle for our township, which is the first uh, for us, and. Um, we're working through the, the uh, administration of it and, and making sure we have projects ready to go to, to meet the requirements. But it, is, it will be a funding challenge for us, whether it's additional taxes and or grants or both. Uh, that's going to be something that we're uh, tracking here in the next two to three years. Uh, additionally, there, I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with um, Northwest EMS, uh, but they are phenomenal. Uh, EMS department or company, and they provide coverage for, I think, virtually all of West Donegal, Mountjoy Township, and, and the borough. And they have been facing some financial uh, problems in the past, and we're working hard to try and help them uh, stay afloat. Uh, we definitely don't want to lose 
uh, EMS coverage in this area. I've, I've talked with managers from other parts of the state who have lost their EMS coverage because of financial uh, concerns. And um, there, there were some changes to the law that made it harder for EMS companies to, to uh, track down billing. Um, and that's caused some areas of the state to lose coverage, which means somebody may wait 45 minutes for an ambulance to show up. And that's, that's really kind of frightening. We're very blessed with what we have. So that's one of the things we're watching uh, on a fairly regular basis. We want Northwest EMS to be as, as uh, financially sound as possible. Uh, Rebecca and Justin touched on a lot of the sim similar things that we face. Uh, so I won't belabor that much more. I, I will close with this. I do not have ducks. I don't have a row. I have squirrels and they're everywhere. So uh, that's the life of a municipal manager. Great. Well, thank you so much, John and, and Justin and Rebecca. We really appreciate your your insight and in clarifying some of the structures of our various townships and uh, the borough here. Um, it's great, great to hear uh, how things are, are progressing and, and, of course, what you're keeping your eyes on uh, looking to the future. And, and speaking of um, uh, EMS, John, you were just talking about Northwest EMS. Uh, I'm curious if either any of you have um, some thoughts on some of the impact that COVID-19 has had on those local services, emergency services in particular. I, I, I maybe can speak a little bit to it. I know that uh, they keep us very well informed with what they're doing. Uh, they have not, they've been very fortunate. I don't think that they've had any illness within their, within their staff. PPE uh, has been a big issue for them. But again, the county, I think, kudos to the county. The county has done a lot of good work to make sure that uh, PPE was made available or, or avenues to get PPE was available. So I, I think um, it's, it's been impactful uh, to Northwest EMS and to most EMS companies in general. But the, the take I get from the regular emails I receive from them is that uh, it's steady as she goes and they're, and they're able to source the materials they need and keep their staff healthy. Great, thank you for, for that update. Uh, and another another question uh, for for all three. Um, all three of you had mentioned at some point along the way of uh, about um, you know, building and housing residential in the area. Uh, one of the uh, big national uh, expectations, as a, as partial as a result of COVID nineteen, is the the movement uh, migration of people out of cities uh, and more into suburban and rural areas. Um, do you have any sense of projections of how that might play out, particularly for a region, an area like ours, which is really beautifully situated between Harrisburg and Lancaster? I think from, from my perspective, um, the migration that you might be hearing about in the news um, might be relegated more to very, very densely packed cities, right? So cities that are um, a little bit more dense than, than even the borough would be. Um, I, I don't think from the borough's perspective, we anticipate uh, a flight of residents out of the borough. In fact, you know, I think in the region, um, overall, we offer a range of housing opportunities, uh, a range of housing prices. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the Elizabethtown region will remain um, an attractive place for people to live and find housing. I would second that. I, I think you're, you're right on there, Rebecca. I, I know from, from West Donegal's perspective, we have uh, with our current developments still uh, approximately 250 to 260 units yet to build before we're built out. And it's across a range of, it's you know, everywhere from townhouses to, you know, to larger, uh, larger acreage, um, uh, housing development such as Bishop Woods and it's across the spectrum. So there is there's a there's a home for there's a price just almost for just about everybody in the region. Uh, but I would think you're right that it's not it's not necessarily leaving here. It's people coming here from places like New York and, and New Jersey and other more densely populated areas. Sure, absolutely. Justin? Yeah, and yeah, same here. And I think you know it's I, we're right next to one of our three parks and we we saw especially when people were at home we saw a lot of people using the parks taking a walk bringing their children in 
Um, and I think you see people valuing the open space and having these recreational uh, spaces, even if they're in, let's just say a typical subdivision where, you know, they may have a yard and everything, but you know, it's not inconvenient to get to one of our community parks, you know, any three of the municipalities to be able to get to a community park and have that open space where it may be more of a challenge in um, some of these bigger metropolitan areas. Um, so I think there's a lot of, a lot of benefits to our, to our region without a doubt. So we, you all kind of see some uh, some capacity then in this area for for growth. Um, any recommendations and thoughts that we can share with the business community in ways in which they might um, be able to encourage some of that that uh, possible growth? I guess I'll kick off. I mean, the the, the downtown for us. So so we've got. Um, a range of businesses here, right? So we've got everything from very, very small businesses, mom and pop stores, um, people with businesses out of their homes, all the way up to uh, a Mars, um, uh, you know, that's employing uh, over 370 associates and, um, and is a, a pretty intensive uh, industrial um, operation. You know, I think that first and foremost, um, I, I would say that that this is still a very, very healthy place at Lancaster County overall in the Elizabethtown region is still a very healthy place to do business, to start a business, <clears throat> excuse me, and to grow a business. Um, and so I think there are resources here. Um, there's, a, there's a really great network of support here, not just in the Elizabethtown area, but in Lancaster County through the Chamber um, and the Economic Development Company of Lancaster County. So um, in terms of finding a network, finding resources. Now is still a very good time to be in business. I know it's extremely difficult right now, um, but I think as we start to get on the backside of the pandemic and things start to get to whatever the new normal might be, um, that this is still a very, very attractive place to start and grow a business. I, I would agree with that too. I, I think that uh, it's a very, um, from a business standpoint, it's a very diverse community in that there's all kinds of things happening. It's not, it's not focused on just the industrial park or just the downtown. There's, there's things happening too in, in Mount Joy Township that, that are commercial based that I, I think it, it, it would be an ideal place for people to start business because of, of, of that kind of thing that's happening. We, we do have some commercial land yet within our urban growth boundary that, that could potentially be developed at some point. So I think it's a it's a prime spot. I agree, and I think you know something that we've we've all discussed. I'd say the three of us have discussed is how do we make these connections to you know downtown and all this sort of thing from the growing neighborhoods around it. How do we make them stronger? Um, how do we encourage you know patronizing local businesses and things like that? So that's certainly a, a major component of it. You know, people who are deeply rooted or have generational. Um, to, to the community understand it, but, you know, a lot of the folks that may be moving in from other areas, you know, how do we, how do you reach them? How do you make sure they understand, you know, the, um, the goings on and the different businesses, you know, that I, the people are, uh, I, th I think you see a lot of people looking for unique, um, whether it's places to, to eat or drink or whatever it may be, you know, they're looking for that sort of thing in their community that's really convenient for, you know, evening or weekends or whatever it may be. Thanks, Justin. Um, I have a, it's really interesting that the topic of real estate came up because next week um, we're going to have, uh, our topic is going to be totally on real estate. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from some local agents about kind of what is the state of real estate in COVID. So I'm sure they have a lot of good info to share for us. Um, John, you had brought up about uh, you know, the, the transfer taxes and how that affects the municipalities. It's so much more complicated than just, you know, who's selling houses and where right. and who's moving here every, there's all these different moving parts. Um, the migration out of cities, I do think we have a very attractive community to live in. And so it's interesting to think about how that is going to affect us, especially because um, what COVID has suddenly changed for our society is that people are realizing how much more mobile work is a possibility, you know. Um, and I think another cool thing that's come about it, out of that is Justin, you just mentioned like people who've lived here generationally. I see, so I'm, I'm technically a millennial, but just barely, right? So I'm in the, the, in the very beginning end of that, that I get to count as that, but my husband's Gen X, so I won't let him forget it. Um, but so I, what I see in, in my generation and 
um, when you looked at someone like uh, Pete Buttigieg, who ran for president, he was kind of an example of this. There's a, a new wave of younger folks, you know, earlier in their careers who are saying, look, with the opportunities that we have now, I don't have to move to a big city to have some of the same career opportunities or, you know, to be involved in really big things that are happening. And I think COVID's really just going to accelerate that because the cost of living in these cities is so high and then the danger of, you know, living that close to other people. Um, so I think I'm really excited to see where that goes. Um, wondering your thoughts about how, you know, when we have more people who stay invested in their communities and I guess I'm a little advisor because I'm one of those people right who decided to come back to the community that I grew up in and with fresh eyes and realize what a great place it was um, how we can kind of harness those uh, people who are you know generationally from this area coming back um, in not the same world whereas you had to kind of get out to have a different perspective now you can stay here and have that. So if you have any thoughts about, about how that would affect our community in the next decade or so, we'd love to hear them. I, I think I, I read an interesting article uh, talked about technology and how COVID probably jumped technology five years ahead because we had, we were forced into the situation where we had to do things online. I mean, we, we did our meetings, our township meetings via li live stream on YouTube. Uh, we had our first in-person meeting uh, on Monday of this week but we streamed the meeting because we have, I know I have residents who come to meetings who normally would come to meetings who are uh, in a, in a, you know, a category of person that might be at risk. So, you know, we continue to do those things and we probably will continue to do some form of that for a while. Uh, but I think you're, you're right. Having, having that tech, I see technology infrastructure maybe being a challenge. Um, I know I would love to have, fiber available within West Donegal Township. I have very little fiber available in West Donegal Township. Everything's copper. You're either going to be, uh, you're either uh, on a kind of a DSL line with CenturyLink or you're on a cable modem with Comcast. And everybody loves to throw stones at Comcast, but that's the only, those are your choices. And, you know, I, to make it more attractive, I think, you know, having a better, the ch big challenge I see is a better technology backbone, which we currently struggle with. I, I, probably, and I've, I would imagine Justin would say the same thing in some farther flung sections of his township that, that getting, getting um, uh, a really robust internet backbone into some of these locations is difficult. I, I, that's that's the, one of the bigger challenges I see is the technology infrastructure. Because we did, we kind of made this artificial five-year jump and are we going to be able to support and sustain that long term? Yeah, I yeah, think I'm that's wondering. super a super urgent point, John. As as those of us who have kids in the school district are, you know, is the hot topic of the week. All anyone's talking about is what's what's going to happen with school, and parents are choosing that you know, to avoid disruptions, they want to maybe just keep their kids online all year. The school district is saying there's going to be a more robust online option. But I know personally in my house, we just, we really struggled with trying to work from home, um, have Zoom meetings, plus three kids on, you know, different computers, trying to keep that internet connection working. And also, you know, so I can get through a work meeting. Sometimes I need a kid to be playing Minecraft, you know, on the internet so that I can get through it. Um, so I really think that's going to be at the top priority for all three of you this year to figure out how can we continue to improve that infrastructure. It's going to be necessary. Yep. And I wonder, uh, Kelly, um, kind of piggybacking on what you're just saying, uh, uh, if, if uh, any of our panelists can speak to any rollouts that we can expect in the area of 5G, knowing that that's going to be that might in some respects be uh, hugely impactful and far less expensive than fiber optic. Um, any, any thoughts on, on where we are in that, that process? I wish I had information for you on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't know if John and Justin do, but I, I don't have no. um, you know, yeah. a crystal ball or otherwise, um, but technology certainly is going to drive a lot of what happens. Um, but I also think it's it's um, equally important um, that we're still talking about a community full of people. 
um, and the connections between people um, and, and how people interact and how they communicate with each other, um, the social service agencies, the local government involvement, all of the different partnerships that go on, um, that really is the foundation of, of how a community th thrives and gets better and, and um, it, it is able to be flexible and agile when you're dealing with stuff like this. So I 100% agree that technology is going to drive a lot of what happens, but to be honest, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to the people that are here um, and, and how we treat each other and how we are welcoming to each other. If we're talking about people coming into the area, moving into our area, how we're welcoming to them um, and how we all kind of work together to, to make the best of it. Yeah, that's that's a that's a fantastic point, Rebecca. I, I think it's so important that we all remember. Uh, I think on the other end of this, one of the things we're all going to discover is a, a, a new uh, joy in being in one another's presence, uh, making music together, listening to music together, going to theatrical productions. Just um, and, and I look forward to that day. I think it's gonna. There should be a parade down down every Main Street um, when when we've we've licked this. So thank you for reminding us of how important that is in building community. I just have one more um, question for you guys, and it's been alluded to. I think John already said that um, now that you know meetings are back in person, at least for now, um, you've continued to have the Zoom participation. I know, again, in my circles, I had seen before COVID hit a lot of um, concern about we need to have you know borough council meetings or township meetings, supervisor meetings, and school board meetings. Uh, some kind of online option uh, where people can zoom in because they don't have childcare for their kids or, you know, they're, they're working and they want to follow up and watch it later. People do want to participate, but, you know, one of you started out with the, you know, the, I think it was you, Rebecca, about local government and that, I think it was a Jefferson quote, that that's so important and people do want to participate, but there's so much more need now, even right before COVID, but again, it accelerated it to say, we need people to be able to connect um, and speak at meetings without actually physically having to be there. So I'm just curious about what your thoughts are about continuing to do that uh, as we move forward. I, I can say we're going to, I think our plan is to continue to live stream via YouTube. It's not necessarily interactive, but it, it's like broadcasting the meeting. Um, and we do respond to comments that come back as part of that live stream. We try and respond to those comments. It's not truly a Zoom setup. Uh, it's it. I've I've done more Zoom than I thought ever thought I would ever do, and uh, it's it's great for the purpose we're doing right now, or for a small group of people to have a meeting. But uh, I I struggle with it from a large public setting. Uh, I'm a member of Rotary, and we've done Rotary via Zoom. And uh, when you have 35 people on a Zoom call, trying to manage that uh, and manage the, the responses and who's saying what is, I think you guys are doing a phenomenal job with this, but uh, from a, I'd have to hire staff to help me run the whole thing during the meeting and I, it's just not worth it. So, so I think we're going to continue to live stream via YouTube, just uh, very similar to the, what the county commissioners do. They, they record that you can watch any county commissioner meeting via a live stream. You don't, you don't have to be there, uh, but it's not interactive. It's, it's more like a television broadcast. And I think we'll probably continue to do that uh, at least for a while until I start seeing viewership drop off. I've, I've been kind of pleasantly surprised at the number of views the video gets after it go after it's posted to YouTube after the live stream, I've been kind of shocked. It's like, oh my gosh, 35 people looked at this. Well, the, obviously they were much more comfortable looking at it on YouTube than coming and sitting in the meeting room. So, uh, great. Uh, let's let's be as more as transparent and as open and and show as much as we possibly can. I, I would love to have much more participation than than we normally do. Yeah, I would. I would the transparency. Um, the, the, and as we just stumble our way through trying to figure out technology and, and doing Zoom meetings, and um, you know, we, we stink at it right now, to be honest. We change our setup every meeting, um, but we're getting better at it. And I think, you know, from, from Elizabeth Town Borough's perspective, we will actively discuss how can we um, budget for and continue to get better um, at, at allowing for um, technology to help us broadcast our meetings and allow for additional participation uh, going into the new year. 
Well, thank you all so very much. Uh, we're, we're kind of at the end of our time together today, and I just want to take a moment to thank you so much for our wonderful panelists, uh, Rebecca Denlinger, uh, John Yoder, and Justin Evans, uh, for all of your, your support uh, and, and willingness to participate. And also thanks to the uh, Elizabethtown Chamber of Commerce and to Elizabethtown College for their collaborative effort to bring this vital resource to our business community. Matt, Kelly, can, can I you just tell add us about real quickly about... Um... I also wanted to make a point that as we talked about how, you know, there's partnerships are so important. I wanted to make it really clear that um, all, th all, both of the townships and the borough do make annual contributions to the chamber's budget and support businesses in that way. Also support a lot of our efforts um, in many different ways. We have, um, John is our vice president of our board. Um, from Mountjoy Township, we have Deb Dupler as a representative. She's a supervisor on our chamber board. And from the borough, we have Neil Ketchum, who is a um, council, borough counselor. So just wanted to make that clear to everyone, uh, that collaboration that happens all the time. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you for reminding all of us of, of the, the sense of community that we all contribute to um, the townships and boroughs um, and, and the way we all work together. It makes Elizabethtown a great place to live and, and mm -hmm. grow a business. So thank you so very much. And I think, Kelly, you have a little bit of information about next week's uh, episode. Yep. Next week, same time, same place, Wednesday at 12 o'clock, we are going to be talking about the state of real estate. So I shared a lot about that all, already. Um, come up with some great new questions today and please send in your questions ahead of time. We're going to have our guests are Greg Grogan and John Smith, who are both local realtors, uh, and they'll be updating us on what's going on in the market. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody stay safe out there. We'll see you next week. Same time, same bat channel. <laughs>